And as we begin this new series today, I want to ask you a question. And it's a personal question. It's a close, maybe kind of intimate question. But the question is simply this. What would it take for you to stand in awe of God? What would it take for you to stand in awe of God? What would have to happen in your life? What would God have to do? What would he have to provide for you to stand in awe, to be amazed? To be awe or in awe is to be astonished. It's to be kind of taken aback because of how significant something is. So what would it have to be? I'm not talking about like, well, if I, you know, was able to go to lunch and afford it, my bank wouldn't like, you know, overdraft and I'd, you know, that would, I'd be, praise God. I mean, that's kind of like a level of it. But I mean, like true awe, where your mind is in disbelief, where it's blown away, who would have to get healed in your life? Who would have to be provided for in a way beyond measure? What would God have to, how would God have to show himself to someone who seems distant, who seems like they're anti-God? What would God have to do in that person's life for you to be blown away, to stand in awe of who God is? What anxiety or depression would have to be removed? What joy or purpose or meaning would have to be fulfilled in your life? What would it take? And if you know the answer to that question, I'd love for you to write it down somewhere where you're not going to forget Jot it in your phone, write it down on a card, do whatever you hit. But if you don't know the answer, that's okay too. Because that's what this whole series is about. This whole series is about us standing in awe of who God is and what he's capable of doing. And as we begin this new series, my intent or my hope or my prayer has been that as we move forward in faith, God would bring something to us. God would reveal something to us. God would show up in such a significant way that we can't help but be moved in awe and wonder and that it would only spur us to dream and wonder what could happen again in the future. What could take place? And I think that's one of the things that I want to invite you to is to dream and to believe and to imagine what God could do if you were willing, if you allowed it, if you participated if you join in. And I think that's one of the wonders of the Christmas season, is it not? Christmas kind of has this nostalgia. It has this, you know, kind of sense of home, this this kind of imaginary feeling to it, where we're just inclined to want to wonder and to kind of want to stand in awe. You walk down, you know, 6th Avenue, and they've got those big, you know, light things, and they have the, the big ornaments, and then you have Radio City Music Hall decked out, and you have the tree, and you have the 5th Avenue shops or Madison Avenue shops, and you have all these things decorated, and the trees, and all these feelings... And then it kind of takes you back to this place where you just kind of dreamed unleashed, where you just imagined. You know, and I think one of the joys of a parent is seeing Christmas through the eyes of my daughter, where she gets to envision something, where she gets to dream and believe, and there's not this kind of repercussion or consequence for believing, you know, for having hope. Yeah, I mean, she loves all of it. She loves Christmas movies, she loves Christmas PJs, she loves the decorations, you know, she loves the snacks, everything. I I got gifted, uh, someone gifted to me, they were listening to the podcast, and they they heard me talk about the one message, I don't even remember when it was, but sometime back, when I talked about how I didn't grow up, like, wearing PJs, and so I was wearing PJs to school, and I didn't know until a teacher, like, called me out on it, and and so they felt bad, so they gifted me Christmas PJs, (laughs) like, Red and white candy cane PJs. I'm not showing the picture. (laughs) So for our Christmas decorating party, Gia, like, begged me, please, Poppy, wear the Christmas PJs. And I'm like, I'm not doing it. Can't do it. And so I went in the room, and I put them on like a good dad, wore them for a while I was decorating the tree, got changed immediately after and threw them away. I was like, I was just like, one and done, that's it, you know, retire, because they had like Santa Claus on the front, like, it was just a bit much, but she loves it, she loves the Christmas season, she loves dreaming and imagining and believing and wondering about what could be, and I think that's just kind of part of being a kid, isn't it? You just are kind of blown away. You stand in awe of stuff. You, you wonder about what could be. We were walking to school, her and I, a couple weeks ago, and I taught her about fingerprints. And she's like, what? And I was like, yeah, every person has fingerprints, and you have them on your hands, and they're unique to you. No one else has it. Everyone has it. We were talking about riddles. And so I was like, what is one thing everyone has but nobody has? And, and she, or no one else has. And she's like, what? And so, so she's walking down the street like this, looking at her fingers, like trying to figure like, like the lines and understand her fingerprints. She's just like naturally captivated. 
And, and I think the, the great thing is seeing her eyes kind of enlarge and, and, and imagine what could be. But I think the sad thing is that's how we all used to be. We all used to wonder. We all used to stand in awe. We all used to dream. We all used to wish and believe that something magical could take place in our lives and on our behalves. But then we grew up. And whether it was an education system, whether it was a parent, whether it was a job, whether it was the practicality of just getting by day to day, or the struggle of just having to make it and hoping that you can just kind of get to the next phase of life or to the next moment, that, that you just kind of lose this sense of wonder, and in a sense, we become too mature for our own good. And, and we eliminate this ability to dream and to hope and to expect, because we stop wondering, so we stop standing in awe, and then when we stop standing in awe, we stop expecting that God's going to do anything. And because we stopped expecting that God's going to do anything, we stopped experiencing God do anything. Yeah. You see, it's not that we, God stopped providing the miracles. It's not that God stopped his part or he fell short on his end of the bargain. It's that we stopped experiencing something because we stopped expecting it. And we stopped expecting it because we didn't stand in awe anymore of what God could do in our lives. Yeah. And so we've missed the mark or we've fallen short of that expectation or we've fallen for of that, or short of that dream. And, and, it, and it kind of, causes us to stand in this place where the things that should wow us, the things that should uh, make us stand in awe, the things we should marvel at, no longer do it for us. And not only do they no longer do it for us, we no longer do it for ourselves. Which brings me back to this Christmas story. It brings me back to this original moment, this pivotal moment in human history, this climactic moment where the Messiah, the Savior of the world, was being born in the human flesh, in skin, flesh and bone, and coming to dwell among us. And it's this marvelous, it's this magical story, it's incredible, it's phenomenal, it's all of these things, but when we look at this story, it just kind of becomes trite. It becomes routine. In fact, Christmas becomes more about something other than the Messiah coming into the world. And I'm not talking about the commercialism of that, because, uh, listen, we, our kid still believes in Santa, so we're all for that. Um, I'm, I'm talking about the reality that this was a significant moment in human history, and that to the people in the story, to Mary, to the shepherds, to the magi, to the, to the, to the characters that we read about, this was not just another day in the neighborhood. This was a significant moment in their lives, a day and time that would come in which they would stand in awe of something taking place in their lives, and they got to participate in it. Because these weren't just characters on a black and white page or red page. This was real life human beings. This was their story as much as it was Jesus' story. This was what they were dreaming for what they were believing for, people who grew up in a culture where a Messiah was promised and they didn't know when it was coming because if you know anything about the Bible or if you don't, here's good news for you, I'll teach you. There was a gap of 400 years from the last time they heard a prophet speak to them from God to the time that Jesus arrived. So for 400 years, these people heard nothing. For the previous 1,200, they heard everything about a Messiah. They heard everything about a Savior. They heard everything about this coming moment that would arrive, that was promised, that was guaranteed. And yet for 400 years, all of a sudden, God was AWOL. Yet these people, these characters, all of a sudden had the opportunity to experience something, to step into something, though they had no reason to believe God would bring the Messiah into their lives at this time in history. They had no reason to expect that God would allow me to be a part of something miraculous. They had no real reason or evidence to say, well, God told me decades ago or God told me hundreds of years ago that my life was going to be pivotal in this. Yet here they are in the midst of this epic moment, in the midst of this, this time and point where, where the divine meets the, the natural and, and they intersect and they become one. And yet they get to play a part of this story. And, and, and the thing that I think kind of strikes me is that for most of us today, the Christmas story is no longer magical in that way. It's no longer wondrous in that way. It's no longer marvelous. Yes, it's important. 
But be honest with yourself. When was the last time you stood in awe of the fact that Jesus came to this earth? When was the last time that you marveled that someone got to hold Jesus as a baby? That the Messiah allowed himself to be cared for by us? I think about the struggle it is to just be a dad with a normal kid, let alone God. <laughs> and, 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 and yet this is reality. This is what's actually happened. You know, and, and, and the last time that, that the Christmas story had an impact on you was probably when you were a child. Yes, again, we go to church, we sing the songs, we do the peace, but to actually stand in awe and wonder and to think all of this happened, but it was only foreshadowing that greater things were yet to happen. Because this wasn't, though it was a climactic moment at that point in human history, it wasn't the end of the story. It was the beginning of a new story And that story that God planned to unfold and develop post-Jesus was a story that we get to be a part of. And it was a story that wasn't supposed to just kind of end with wondrous miracles or end in in a moment of awe. The time Jesus arrived there. So 2,000 years later, we just stand here and say, okay, yeah, he came good. Sing some songs. Great. My life is going good. And move on. So what would it take for you to stand in awe? What does it take? For God to move in such a way where you would stand and wonder, if God did this, what else could he do? And and I don't pose these questions in a judgmental or even a condescending way, but rather in a way that should provoke your mind to think and your heart to move and your spirit to work. Because God wants to do something wondrous on your behalf. God wants you to stand in awe of him. God wants you to see how marvelous he is, how incredible he is, that what happened in the past can happen in your life and that what God wants to do in the future is greater than what you've seen thus far. And and, and that's why I feel this series is so significant. That's why I feel these messages are so important because when I look back on what we've experienced, I recognize that I've stood in awe of God in my life, but I don't want it to stop. And when I think about our church, it's, it's, it's equally true. I mean, I look back just over the course of this year, January, I think it was 7th, we were meeting here for the first time, and we had, like, meta gold balloons, and we had, like, donuts, and we were celebrating. Like, we got into a space. We, we prayed for this Christmas offering, and, and God provided. And one of the things we were going to use the funds for was to secure a venue. And we got into a venue, and we came here, and it was like, wow, this is really cool. This is epic. And we were kind of doing things in a different way. And then people started coming. And it's like, how are these people coming? We're like, we don't really know. We just know they show up. And so we say, okay, come and hang out with us and be a part of this. And they come and they stay. And then I think about the fact that, you know, even right now we have kids meeting in a space where they're learning about Jesus. And they love it. And they're excited about it. I used to get dragged to church as a kid. My mom would pinch me whenever I was acting out of hand. (laughs) She would yell at me or like smack me. Ew, pop, just like a quick whack. (laughs) I was like, she's trying to be spiritual and like not get caught by someone. Like, you just jam me with an elbow. <laughs> it was nuts. <coughs> but my daughter loves it. We didn't have that a year ago. My daughter got saved here. She met Jesus because of this. She loves Jesus because of this. You know, we, we, we think about the community and the people like, I was joking with our friends last night. I was like, you know, it's really crazy is that people come in and they're like, uh, for, as soon as I walked in, it just feels like home. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's weird. We don't even have a welcome home sign. <laughs> I mean, how is that possible that you feel like it's home, but it doesn't say welcome home? <laughs> Imagine that. You could create a home without telling people it's home. Yeah. <laughs> but they would walk into it and feel it. And if this is what God has done in 2018, what more could he do? (coughs) Where else could we go? What else could happen in our lives? What else does God want to do on our behalves? For you, each of you, for me, for us. I mean, it's mind-blowing. You know, this is just the foundation of where we are. And, and, and the thing is that God, because listen, we could, we could kind of like rest our laurels on what's taking place. 
But God's not in the business of settling for less. God's not in the business of shrinking back. God's not in the business of saying, well, I did that once before, but listen, I used all my tricks. Three wishes and you're up. Thank you so much. This is what God wants to do and take us to another level. And so if this is what we've seen, if this is where we've gone, what could happen next? We need to dream. We need to imagine. We need to wonder of what could happen that will cause us to stand in awe again. And that's why we're in this series. So with that in mind, we're going to jump into the story of Mary. And we're going to look at her story. And I guess if you want a message title, I'm, I'm, I'm titling this To Stand in Awe. As in, what does it take to stand in awe? What has to happen? What's the process, if you will, in our lives? What are the things? Because, listen, we all want to stand in awe, but there's some problems we got to overcome. Yeah. There's some issues we're facing. There's some challenges taking place in our lives. So what is it going to take for us to stand in awe? And so I'm going to start with Mary's story, beginning in Luke chapter 1. And we'll pick up reading in verse 26. And then we'll read for a little. I'll teach a little, read a little, teach a little, read a little, teach a little. Because I'm Baptist roots, I have three points. (laughs) Make sense? Okay, great. Let me get some water. Okay, Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, we'll come back to this, so don't worry about it. Who's Elizabeth? You'll find out. Well, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, that you're talking about Mary, Elizabeth, your Bible translation is messed up, says this, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, verse 27, to a virgin named Mary, and she was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. (coughs) Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you, verse 29. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Verse 30, don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. And here, here's kind of a, an interesting passage, right? Because greetings favored woman, and Mary's response is confused and disturbed. And she struggled to understand what it means. I mean, it seems pretty obvious you're a favored woman. Like, what do you mean by that? And this is where we find kind of this first problem. If we're going to experience awe, if we're going to experience wonder, this problem that we have to work through in the beginning is this problem of identity. Because the angel spoke favor to her. The angel called her favored. And Mary's response is confused and disturbed. What do you mean I'm favored? That doesn't make sense. In fact, it angers me that you've called me favored. It bothers me. Because God, I don't, know, I don't know what was happening in Mary's life, but if you're disturbed, I'm imagining, she's probably thinking, God, I don't know if you've seen my life. I don't know if you've seen my struggle. I don't know if you've seen my challenge. I don't know if you've seen my frustration. I don't know if you've seen my problems. Jesus, I don't know what you've experienced. I don't know what you're witnessing, but favored is not who I am. And it, she, struggled to, she struggled so much that the angel had to repeat it once again, and tell her, don't be afraid. And, and I think what, what, what this kind of presents to me is that there's really kind of two aspects or two levels of this. You know, there's an identity problem with God. Is God who he says he is? And then there's an identity problem with me. Am I who God says I am? And I think we, we, we kind of look to God, well, well, could God really do that? Or, you know, what, what, like, what is it that, that's going to happen here? And, 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 I, and I think, like, God, is this really, you know, I don't know. I know you did this. I know you said that. I know this is what happened then. But, God, I don't know about you. Mm-hmm. At least not like that. And then in Mary's life, there's her own problem, her own view of self. And isn't it interesting that how you view yourself can limit what you get to stand in awe of? Mary's view of herself was going to limit what she was going to get to experience or had the potential to limit what she would experience. You see, see, Mary's wrestling with this. Am I, like, how am I favored? I'm confused. I'm disturbed. I'm afraid. I'm perplexed. But I'm not favored. In fact, later you could see how she viewed herself because she sings a song and, and, and she says this. 
in part of her song. Uh, she says, <clears throat> you know, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he took notice of this lowly servant girl. So she was a nobody, at least to herself. And maybe she felt like she was a nobody to everyone else, but because she was a nobody to herself, that's all that mattered. Because she wasn't favored, because she wasn't you know, awesome, because she wasn't supreme, because she didn't have this thing. But the fact of the matter is that God's identity hasn't changed. God is still who he says he is. So maybe it's our identity that needs to change. Because wow. God is still true. God is still just. God is still compassionate. God is still loving. God is still is gracious. God is still generous. None of that has changed. So it's not that God's identity has changed, or it's not that God's identity needs to change, but if we're going to stand in all, maybe our identity needs to change. And maybe instead of seeing yourself as lowly, you need to see yourself as loved. Maybe instead of seeing yourself as worthless, you need to see yourself as worthy. Maybe uh, you need to stop kind of feeling or seeing yourself as forgotten and believe that you're actually favored, as Mary did. And if you're going to work through this identity problem, you need to kind of flip the switch as to who you see God as and who you see yourself as. And so with each of these problems, I want to provide a question. I'm not going to give you the answers. I'm just going to give you a question. Because I believe if you come to the answers on your own through the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll find better answers than I could provide you. So here's the question I'll leave you with. What has God spoken to you, about you, and for you? What has God spoken to you, about you, and for you? What has he told you about himself? How has he revealed himself to you? What has he told you about you? That you're chosen, you're loved, you're called, you're forgiven, you're saved, you're mine, you're protected, you're provided for, you're believed in, you're supported, you're strengthened, you're encouraged. What is it that he's spoken to you about you? And then take it a step further, what is it he's spoken about you, to you, for you? What favor is he bestowing upon your life that you're so quick to reject, that you're so quick to suppress because you've misplaced your identity or you've embraced an improper identity? What is it that God has spoken to you, about you, and for you? Moving on back in the story. Verse 31, here we go. It says this, the angel speaking says, You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. <clears throat> the Lord God will give him his, the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Uh, verse 34, <clears throat> Mary says this. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. Isn't it funny how we always ask how? Like the angel hasn't even stopped talking. She just interjected. But how? How? You know, how could this happen? I, I'm, I'm a virgin. How could I have a baby? How could this happen? I mean, that's typical women, but that's men also. <laughs> like they need all the details, you know, fill in the gaps. Oh, hold up, angel Gabriel. We got some, I don't know if you know how this thing works. I know you're a heavenly body. I'm an earthly body. But let me tell you how this thing works real quick. So she had to do some, explana like some explanations. But we always are quick to jump into, like, how is this going to work? But listen, ask yourself this. How has anything miraculous happened in your life? How has anything that God has done taken place in your, in your life? By God, through God, and, and alone because of God. So it's not about how. But she says, how? Verse 35, the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. Verse 36, what's more, your relative Elizabeth, come back to her, has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but now she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. And, 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 and this kind of brings you to the second problem, which is the evidence problem. The evidence problem, how, God? How is this going to happen? How could this be? How would we go about this? What would, what would it take? What needs to happen? What things have to be arranged? What, what pieces got to get figured out? And we, and we start trying to compile evidence, and we struggle and we grasp at straws because we don't see all the details. We don't know how it's going to work. But, but here's the thing. This is why this piece about Elizabeth is so important. 
because Elizabeth was Mary's cousin. And so you just read that like, okay, well, why does Elizabeth keep coming back in the story? But listen to this. Look at, ver- oh, well, I'll read it to you. Verse 7 says this about Elizabeth. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. Verse 24 says this. Soon afterward, speaking about Elizabeth's husband, it says his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. Okay, so why does this matter? Because remember in the beginning it says Elizabeth was in her sixth month of pregnancy. Okay, she had been hidden for five months. She didn't tell anybody that she was pregnant. This was nobody's business, nobody's news. Mary, her close cousin, knew about it. So when the angel said, by the way, your cousin is pregnant, and people said that she wouldn't get pregnant, so trust me when I say you're going to get pregnant. Look at the evidence, Mary. Take note of the impossible that I've already done, Mary. See what everyone declined, Mary. Look at what everyone said wouldn't happen, and look at what I made happen, and no one knows about it yet because she's in hiding, but you know. You've seen what I'm capable of doing, Mary. And, and this, so this problem with the other thing, I mean, it's crazy how in our disbelief for the next miracle, we will work to discredit all the previous miracles. Think about that. In our disbelief for the next miracle, because we can't believe that it's going to happen, we'll work extremely hard to discredit every miracle that God's already done. There's this evidence problem, guys. If we're going to stand in awe, if we're going to stand in wonder once again, then we need to kind of look at the evidence around us and believe that if God did it then, if God did it there, that he'll do it for us and he'll do it again. This is the evidence that we have. And so again, I'll pitch another question to you. What evidence do I have to believe God? What evidence is present in your life? Where have you seen God work? Who's been saved? Who's been healed? Who's been restored? What marriage has been salvaged? What hope has been brought back? What family member has been resuscitated? What life-giving thing has taken place in your life? What job did you get that you shouldn't have gotten? What provision came through? What check arrived in the mail the day, the moment you needed it? What conversation, what friendship, what relationship that you have today that you look back and say, it was a miraculous intervention on God's part. And because that happened, I have all the evidence I need to believe it'll happen again. Yeah, come on. Your cousin Elizabeth is pregnant, Mary. Look at the evidence, Mary. Mm-hmm. See what I've done, Mary. And if I did it for her, then surely I'll do it for you. Amen. And if I did it back then, then surely I'll do it again. Yeah. Because that's who God is. That's what God desires. This is what God intends in our lives. Verse 37 says this, for nothing is impossible with God. I'll read it again for the people in the back. (laughs) For nothing is impossible with God. Verse 38, notice Mary's response. I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. This brings us to the third And final problem that I'll share, and it's the trust problem. The trust problem. The angel speaks, nothing is impossible with God. Other translations will write it, nothing will be impossible with God. I think I like that that treatment of the verse a little bit better because it speaks to a forward time. It speaks to a future moment that nothing will be impossible Not nothing has been impossible, but nothing will be impossible. Mary's response, I am the servant. May everything you have said about me come true. The trust problem. Where will we stand? Where will we place our trust? To what what will we align in that moment of faith when we gather the evidence when we've identified who we are, what ultimately will we decide to believe? Who will we decide to believe? What, what are the things that we're going to take from God and say, okay, God, if you did it then, then I'm going to trust you again. And if I trusted you with my salvation, Jesus, then I'm going to trust you with my life moving forward. And if I trusted you in my heart, and if I believe you're big enough to keep me out of an eternity in hell, then I believe you're big enough to provide for my finances, God. If you're big enough to provide for my family, then you're big enough to provide for my work. If you're big enough to provide for my friends, then you're big enough to provide for me. The trust problem. Mm -hmm. When I I take that, that money 
And I just take it out of my wallet. And I say, God, I'll give you this. Every time I do it, it's a symbol of trust. Hey, the, the fact of the matter is, I don't really, I don't really give from the standpoint of like a financial thing anymore. Like it's no longer about, well, did I give the right amount of money? Did I give like the percentage that I was supposed to give? The answer to those things is long ago became yes. The answer now is like when I give, do I, do I really trust God? Yeah. Yeah. Do I really trust God? Not just with the amount that I give, but with the heart that I give. Mm-hmm. And, and my money is just a, a symbol of that. It's just a symbol of, God, I, I trust you to the fullest extent. Mm-hmm. I trust you so much that I will look at a number in my account and watch it go down after I give to you because I know only you can bring it back up. Yeah. So I trust you, God. And, and I'm going to surrender and I'm going to yield my, my uncertainty. I'm going to yield my fear, my apprehension, my worry. And I'm going to trust. And the question that I always come back to is whose words will I believe? God's? The enemy's? Mine? Whose words will I believe? I mean, if we know who God is, and we know who we are, and we have the evidence to support the case that God is capable of doing what he once did to a greater and bigger extent in the future, then why is it that we still struggle to trust? And I think, honestly, the answer is quite simple. It's not great, but it's simple. I think we would rather settle for their certainty of less than believe in the unknown possibility of more. Why don't we trust? We would rather settle in the uncertainty of less, or the certainty, excuse me, of less. At least I know this is what I'm going to get. Than believe for, dream for, imagine for, go for the unknown possibility of more. But here's the thing, the final statement I'll leave you with. What you choose to believe will dictate what you get to see. What you choose to believe will dictate what you get to see. And this isn't some sort of like positive words, vibes type stuff. This is foundational spiritual Christianity 101. You believe in Jesus to save you. So you expect that you'll see heaven. That was the entry. But what you believe, what you choose to believe, where you choose to trust, what evidence you seek to gather, you know, what identity you choose to wear, those things are going to dictate what you get to see. And my prayer and my hope has been that we would choose awe, that we would choose wonder, that we would proclaim in Jesus' name that we will stand in awe once again as a church. That what God did last year, not just financially, but what God did last year or this year is nothing in comparison to what he wants to do next year for our church and for your life. Listen, I'm not just speaking self-centered here or selfishly. It's not just about meta. Meta is about you. Meta is about your transformation. And I don't care if God brings all this money to the church, but your life a year from now is the same as it is today. I want more for you. I want greater for you. I want transformation in your life. I want Jesus to move at a level that he's never moved before. I want you to experience the Holy Spirit like you've never experienced before. I want the presence of God to be palpable in your life where all you can think of is, God, what are you going to do next? God, what are you going to do next? Okay, you need money. Here's money. What are you going to do next? God, you need me to step out in this conversation. What are you going to do next? God, you need me to take a leap of faith and move. Where am I going to go next? God, I want to stand in awe of who you are because it's addicting, because it's satisfying, because it's intentional, because that's how you wired me. You know why I mentioned this in the beginning about Christmas, why these things no longer awe us? Because God never intended for us to be satisfied with the same old things. He wired us 
so that we would believe for and expect more and greater in him, through him, and by him. That's who he is. That's what he wants for us in this series. So with that, let me close this in a word of prayer, and then we'll wrap up our morning.